All right, welcome back. Good morning. So this will be the meet in the middle lecture of our seminar. So we will have 13 in total and today it will be the seventh. Today it will be a little bit practical. So uh, just, just bear with me. And as usual, uh, we will have our base Bayesian warm up. So remember the idea, recall the idea that our previous posterior will be the current prior. So this also applies to our knowledge. Your knowledge at the end of the last lecture will be the, the prior of today, right? So we will uh, briefly talk about what we have covered the last time. So the last time we talked about the idea of a uh, grid approximation and uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the idea is that so the grid approximation works pretty okay if we have a rather simple model, if we have only the coin flipping example or the globe tossing example, however you call it, we only have one parameter <clears throat> in that particular case. We have a binomial uh, model, binomial likelihood function. We only have one parameter that is the, the success rate or the proportion of water, the, of water covering the entire surface of the globe or uh, the, pro the proportion or the, the probability the coin, the face of the coin is facing up if we flip it. So this is the, the only parameter that is in the model. And we could find divide the continuous space between zero and one into discrete spaces and in, into discrete steps. Um, if we have a reasonable amount of steps in between zero and one, we could approximate the posterior shape of the, the theta parameter in that model. Okay, that, that worked pretty okay. We have uh, the, the, the grid search, grid approximation solution to that, uh, to that problem. And that binomial function, in fact, is simple enough that we could even solve it by, uh, by paper and pen. So we could solve it analy analytically. Um, when we have more complex models, for, for example, if we have, I can't really give you a concrete example, but, but maybe a linear regression, we have two parameters. That also works fine if we want to use a grid approximation, that's fine. If we want to have an even, even more complex model, for example, uh, we have 10 parameters, we have 20 parameters. The idea to use grid approximation still applies, so it's possible to do that. Um, but the computation time could increase um, exponentially. So basically, it's, it takes forever to, to run to, um, to, have the, uh, to have the grid approximation. So this is one dis disadvantage. <clears throat> Another disadvantage is that if we have a parameter that has, that, that if, a, if we have a parameter that does not have a, a boundary, so in our binomial example, the theta parameter, so by definition, it is a, it is a parameter above zero, smaller than one. If we have a, a slope parameter in the regression models, the slope parameter can be positive, can be negative, can be, can be anything, can be large, can be small. So there is no uh, theoretical boundary of that slope parameter. Uh, if, we, if we do want to use grid approximation, then we have to arbitrarily uh, superimpose a, a, a lower bound and a upper bound, upper bound onto that uh, theoretically unlimited parameter. So this is another challenge if we do want to use a grid approximation to that uh, <clears throat> regression model example. So then that uh, gave us some motivation to move, uh, move forward to get rid of the grid approximation approach. So what we, we, we had so we, what we would like to solve the, the posterior function. So the posterior function, uh, as we know, if we know the Bayesian equation, the posterior equals to um, the product between the, the prior and the likelihood and then divided by the, the P of data. So that's a normalizing term. So the challenging part is the denominator is rather complex to compute. And uh, that doesn't actually give us too much information if we do compute, because that's basically a marginal distribution over all the possible parameter values, right? P of data is P of data given theta, and then we integral or sum up all the possible theta parameters. So P of data is always P of data. That does not depend on uh, the parameter. That also does not give us information about the parameter. 
So what I'm describing is that that doesn't really uh, so useful to know what p of data is. And then we use the property to say, well, the posterior is proportional to the um, product between prior and the likelihood to get rid of the, the denominator. And then to use this property, we could use a approach called Markov chain Monte Carlo to approximate the shape of uh, the posterior. So then we talked about one example of MCMC -MC robots. So suppose then there is a mountain, we wanted to know where is high, where is low, where is low. And uh, we sent the, the robots and the robot does not have vision. So the robot cannot see where is high, where is low. Instead, the robot has a uh, elevation sensor. It returns to us um, the elevation meters above the sea level. <clears throat> so basically where is high, where is low. And uh, then the, the robots propose random movements and random steps to know, to gain a knowledge of the, uh, of the, the mountain, of the place. So there is a simple rule is that if the proposed new location is higher than the previous location or than the current location, the robots definitely visit the new location. <clears throat> and if on the other hand, the proposed new location is relatively lower than the current position, then the robots calculate the ratio. So if the ratio is okay-ish, um, so quite nice for example, then the robot has a relatively higher probability to visit, <coughs> sorry, the new uh, location. And if the proposed location is a lot lower than the current one, so for example, the ratio is uh, 3%, so then the robot will only have a 3% chance to visit that new location. So this is the simple rule. So to, su to sum up in one sentence, it's like the MCMC is trying to approximate an unknown shape. So this is the goal. So this is the goal of uh, the MCMC algorithm. And uh, as we could imagine, this MCMC algorithm is not so difficult to code, honestly, but there are multiple variants. So we, talk, we, we didn't really say too many of the, the different types of MCMC, but I told you that one of the MCMC algorithm is the, uh, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, so the HMC. But it, it is pretty sufficient, and it is the one uh, used by Stan, the, the programming language. And then today we will be focusing on Stan and uh, how to implement that to our globe tosing example. <clears throat> All right, so that's uh, the kind of a summary from uh, the previous lecture. I guess we are on the same page, more or less. So now let's continue. So we will briefly talk about Stan, the feature of the language. And then we directly will move to the example, so how to implement it. So after the implementation, I will tell you more about the STAN language. Maybe today, maybe the next week. <clears throat> okay, good. So we will go here again. So this is their diagram. We are familiar that already for multiple times, I guess. We have seen this many times. So we start here from the data and then we have, we propose a model and we fit the model to the data by some parameter estimation techniques. Uh, so here we will focus on the MCMC MC part. So it's, it will, there will be a model and then there will be some model estimation. The, the simplest idea is of using STAN is that STAN on its own, it is a language. So it is a programming language. So we have to write a STAN program. So that is our model, okay? <clears throat> And uh, uh, Stan has interface with other platforms, other softwares, for example, R. For example, also Python is possible, MATLAB is also possible, Stata, I think, is also possible, so Julia is the rather new language, it is, it is also possible. So there, Stan has quite a few instances or interfaces to integrate with other programming languages. And if for some people, they just like command line, they want to use terminal, <clears throat> they would like to use terminal to do whatever they want. So then in this case, <coughs> excuse me. So in this case, uh, you can also, there is also a version or a, um, a variant called CMD stand, so command stand. So anyway, stand interacts with other platforms or software. <clears throat> In this case, since we are focusing on R, the, pro, the, the, the language to do statistical computing, we will talk about the interface of R stand. So the stand interface to interact with R language. So as you can see, we have two parts, right? So one is the, the R part and the other one is the stand part. 
And uh, what we do is that we prepare everything. So we, if we run experiments, we just uh, uh, log all the data, and then we put data into R, and then we prepare the data in the in the way in the format that Stan likes. So we prepare our data in R, and then send or parse all the data from R to Stan, and then Stan knows okay where the data is and what the data variables are, and then. And um, then we'll do the computation. So we'll do the, the parameter estimation. So what we do is that instead we will uh, configure a model. It can be a binomial model in the globe case, globe tosin case. It can be some others, regression or more uh, rather complex co cognitive models we will be covering uh, in the second half of the, of the seminar. For example, a simple risk Wagner learning model, we can also do that instead. So that's our purpose. We will focus on that in the uh, second part of the seminar. <clears throat> okay, so we prepare data in R and then we write a model in Stan and then we give the data from R to Stan and Stan does the computation using uh, a variant of MCMC and uh, Stan will then return the results from the computation back to us in R. And then we could do the further analysis in R. So this is the simple idea. So then we, we, uh, we will use the samples. So recall the idea MCMC algorithm draws random samples to approximate the unknown shape. So we will use these samples, random samples, these approximations to do a further um, inference, statistical inference, to draw conclusions according to our research question. <clears throat> Good. So now we go back to these um, steps of space and modeling. And we covered all of this I shown here. And what, how does that look like if we want to do it with Stan? So here, first step, so to have a simple recap, we need a data story. So think about how the data might arise and what this means if we want to do uh, programming or if we want to do parameter estimation using STAN. So a data story simply means we have to write a STAN program. As I told you, STAN is a language on its own. So there is a uh, file extension. It's called .stan. We have to write a model, a separate file, and we save it as something .stan. My model .stan, for example. And then the update part, so the update part means uh, we now have the model, we now have the data, we want to throw the data into the model, right? We feed the model to the data and then to educate our model by feeding it. So this in practice means we run STAN and then using our STAN, the interface with R or some other uh, STAN instances. So this is done by executing uh, the running part. That is the fact, that is the actual, the core of the model estimation. Good. And then the last step is to evaluate. We have to compare the model with the reality. And what does, mean, what does that mean if we want to uh, do it in practice? So that means we could evaluate our MCMC samples, I told you, uh, with, with our standards possible. So our standard package, that, that does not only uh, estimated model that the RSTAN package also contains quite a few useful functions uh, for us to evaluate the results of the MCMC samples. And if you do want to do it a little bit interactively, so the idea is if we want to use RSTAN, we have to know quite a few commands. We have to type commands. And if you like click uh, the buttons, there is a version called Shiny Stan. It's also R Studio based. So then it's brought, it's, it is browser based and we could um, do more interactively to evaluate the results from running our Stan. Good. So those are the steps. As simple as write a Stan model, fit it, evaluate the results. So those are the three steps as simple as that, for this example at least. Good. And before we go to the example, so I can tell you a little bit more of the steps of using STAN. So this is a little bit technical part. You do not have to worry too much, just to give you the idea of how that uh, runs under the hood. <clears throat> so if we have a model written already, and then if we want to uh, 
estimate to fit the model, right? So the first step of that stand is stand program. First, we will read uh, the, the, the file, something dot stand into memory, so into your RAM. And this can be so here, it can be a simple model. And then um, at, on the background, stand will do some source to source transformation um, to translate, to transform the stand file into C++. And then this is, uh, this is where the magic happens. And this is something that you do not have to really know about too much. And then there's a compiling part, uh, C++ compiling, and this might take a while. So if some of you have already tried to use STEM, and if you run that for the very first time, then uh, it, it might take a while. So if you, if you are trying to run the example from the website, and uh, even though the data is simple, the model is also straightforward, but the first time you're running that, that might, that might take uh, one or two minutes. So this is the compiling part. The compilation might take uh, some time. Sometimes it means one or two minutes. Good. So this is only to tell you to explain why that could take quite some time at, uh, at the, if you are running that for the first time. And then all the details, you do not really have to worry too much. <clears throat> so here, what I'm trying to show you is, so the stand model can be simple. So here, not too many lines, and this can be uh, also quite long, quite complex. Depends on how complex your model is. Also how complex your data is. So there's, like, there's uh, some, Dependency. Good. And then you run it, okay? And then you do this posterior analysis or some whatever inference um, with R stan or uh, Shiny stan with the interface. Good. So the minimum uh, requirement for us to understand the stan language is that we have to know stan. It is a language that's um, based on blocks. So it is a block based language. So if we see a stand model so here, this is already a something dot stand model. Basically, you can imagine that this is an empty dot stand model because it's basically empty. There is nothing written inside of each block. So I said it is a block based uh, language. So that means we will have different blocks. So what are those blocks? So here I show you one of the uh, simple skeletons. So this is a skeleton. So if you write a stand model, you can basically write all of this here. It's empty, and then you can give whatever you have. You can give the data, you can give the model. But now I, I only show you the structure. So all, what are the, the blocks? So the very first one is called data. We have to tell STEM, or STEM has to know what the data is. What are the variables, right? So if, for example, in our binomial case, in our globe case, the data is, uh, we have nine times of experiments. We throw the globe nine times, so nine is a data variable. Capital N equals nine, so that's the data, right? We have how many times of water? So this is the observation after tossing or um, throwing the globe. We have six times of water observation. We could say small w equals six, so that's also the data, so data variable. And transform the data, it is something uh, optional. We do not have to talk about that now. We can see how we could use that later. So the simple idea is uh, when we have the data, we could do some pre-processing of the data or, or we could also uh, introduce quite a few, some, some um, constant variables in the transform the data block. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. So we will talk about that later uh, in the second half of the semester. We will see that in other cases. So important is the first one, the data. We have to tell Stan what the data is. This is also important. Parameters. We have to tell Stan so well which parameter we are interested in. In this case, we're interested in a parameter called theta, so the, uh, the water covering the, the surface, the proportion. So this theta parameter, the success rate in the binomial model. So the theta is the unknown parameter that we want to know. So we want to sample uh, from, the, from that posterior. 
So here we could say, well, this is a theta parameter. We, we call it theta. And then we say lower bound is zero, upper bound is one, because we have to, there is a boundary by definition, right? <clears throat> To transform the parameter is a similar idea to the transform the data. It is also optional and we will talk about later, not now. So here, this is the third important block. It is the model block. So the model block basically is the place where we define how we could link the data to the unknown parameter. It is, um, in other words, the likelihood. So the likelihood is, well, we have to connect or link to associate the data with the parameter, right? So the place to do this association, the linking step, is in the model block. And then lastly, there is a block called generative quantity, and we will also talk about that later. So the simple idea is when we have the MCMC samples, if we want to do something with the MCMC sample, we can also do it inside stand. And then if we want to, if we do want to do it, we have to use this block. This is also optional, and we will see that later, not today. <laughs> so to quickly summarize, uh, STAN it is a block-based language. There are different blocks. Three of them are extremely important. First one is the data block. We do have to have a data block. We have to tell what the data is from R to STAN or from Python to STAN. MATLAB doesn't matter. So we have to st tell STAN what is the known part, what is the observation, the data. And so this is optional. The third one, uh, and the, this one, the third block, which is the second important block, is the parameters. We have to tell them what is the unknown part, what are the parameters that we are interested in. And then this is optional. And, and the last important block is the model block. It is the place where we link the data to the parameter. Okay? And the last one is also optional. So the data important, the parameters also important, here the likelihood, this is also important. <clears throat> Great. Are there any questions? So far so good. Everything's fine? Okay, great. Yeah, so there is a question regarding the review comment. We can have some time later to discuss that. <clears throat> Good. So after we know the general structures of the STAN language, so here is the general structure, data, the parameter, the model. So those are the important part. <clears throat> and then we could go back to the example of the binomial model, so the globe example. <clears throat> so recall again, so this is, this is our data. So we have nine times of experiment, we have six times of water observation, and we're interested in the posterior uh, distribution of the theta parameter. <clears throat> so this is the binomial model, and uh, um, if we want to, if we would like to describe it in a st statistical language, we could say here, it reads like uh, the W is distributed as a binomial distribution with number of trials, capital N, and a success rate of theta, okay? And before we move forward, uh, I would like to introduce some of the, the notions. So if you read papers, if you read textbook, you might have seen something like this. So if you read papers that uses a graphical uh, representation of the model, they will use different nodes and you might see something like this. So it is basically a two by two kind of combination. So one dimension is the type of the data. So is the data continuous or is the data discrete? So that this is always important. So from the beginning, I told you uh, whenever you would like to uh, do some statistical um, uh, model, you do have to tell your ask yourself what the data, what data type is, what the what's what data what data you have. 
is it continuous or is it discrete? Okay. So if it is continuous in this case, we will use a circle to represent it. And if we have a discrete data, we use a square to, uh, to refer that a square. So this is one dimension, the type of the data, whether it is continuous uh, or discrete. Another dimension is, is that known or unknown? Is that something that we have observed or is it something that we have to infer the, the, the hidden variable or the latent variable? So if it is observed, we use a shaded color. So the background color, in this case, it is gray, right? Just gray, gray shaded. If it is unknown, then we have no background color, just white or transparent. So then we have these four different combinations. We have a continuous, unknown, so in this case, a white circle. We have a known continuous, continuous. it is a gray circle. And uh, here we have the unknown uh, discrete variable. It is a white square. The last one is a discrete observed variable, a gray square, okay? So we have these four types of graphical representation of the types of the variable. And so now using these uh, notions, the circle and the square, we could represent to re rewrite the model graphically. So what we know is uh, the water, the number of water observation, and also the total number of experiments, six and nine in this case. And both of them, they are discrete, one, two, three, four, six, right? Those are the numbers, uh, discrete integers. And in this case, we need to use a gray square here for the water observation, also the gray square for the total number of uh, experiments. So those are the known part. So here, this is the, the case. And we have an unknown parameter. The unknown parameter is a continuous variable. So we will use a white circle. And what is the relation between among all those parameters or variables? No, not all of them are parameters. So what, what are the, the relationship among those variables? So we have the N and we have the success rate and this tool will determine <clears throat> or decide how many of water observations we are expected to have. So this is a graphical illustration of the binomial model, okay? And we know this, the W is distributed as a binomial distribution with capital N and a theta. And uh, since we have a, a Bayesian inference, we need to have a prior of the theta parameter. So here, the theta parameter is a uniform distribution between zero and, and one. And uh, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, we just say, well, the theta parameter is a uniform distribution between zero and one. <clears throat> Good. So now it is a um, summary, a picture of what we have, right? We have the data sequence, we have the model, and we have a graphical illustration of the model again. And here I give you the prior distribution, and here also uh, the binomial likelihood function using the graphical illustration. Good. <clears throat> Are there any questions? What is that? Are the videos laggy? I don't know, but the, the voice, the audio is okay, right? I will try to uh, minimize my movement of the, cur the, 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 the cursor. <laughs> so then this is a static slideshow. All right. So now we have, uh, do we have any question?
regarding the, the binomial model? I guess no, right? <clears throat> we have seen this many times. Okay, good. So now what we will do finally, so we will go to the practical part. So this is the model and uh, let's do something a little bit different. Instead of I tell you what to run, how to run, and we will write our own STEM model. So this is what I wanted to do. Okay, good. So this is the, the R part. So what I'm, what I'm trying to show you now is how to run this simple binomial model in stand step by step. We talk about uh, the general idea is we prepare everything in R and we write a stand model and then we run the model. So this is the idea, right? And now what we, we, what we want to do the, as the first step is to prepare the data in R. So you just follow me and uh, then uh, today afterwards, if you would like to practice, you could go to this folder, the bino 0 02 binomial folder and then watch the video and uh, try to practice yourself. So, so far, for now, I will go a little bit slowly and then you try to bear with me, okay? So this is the, the R interface, we know that already. And uh, uh, today we will be focusing on binomial underscore globe underscore main file. So this is the file, the script. So where we will prepare the data and also run everything. So I will explain all those commands. So here we can say we could remove everything, remove all the variables to make a clean workspace. And then this is the first step. So this step, is to define what data we have. And we know we have a small w equals six and we have a capital N equals nine. As simple as assign a six to small case w and assigning a nine to the capital N variable. So just variable assignment, as simple as that. And then this step is quite crucial because we will then com combine um, all of the, the variables that we want to send from R to stand into a data list, okay? So here we say, uh, we call the data list as data list by name, and then we use the list function to combine the W, small w and capital N into the same single data list. So if you type here, you will see the data list that contains only two variables, small w and capital N, right? No surprising. And you might wonder, so why we use a data list, why we do not use a data frame, why we do not use a array, for example. It is because uh, first, first reason is that, is that Stan only accepts data, data list as an input argument for the data part. So if you write a data frame, if you write something else, then will not treat it as a, data, a valid data input argument. In other words, it cannot go, for, uh, uh, go forward. It cannot proceed with some un invalid data variable. So th th this is reason one. So reason two is to explain why a data list. It is because sometimes the variables, they do not have the same length or same dimension. The recall the idea of a data frame. So it's a tabular shape. It's, it's a, it's a, it is a basic a matrix, two dimensional. So um, some number of rows and some, some number of columns. We do have to have data like that if we want to have a data frame. But in, in STEM, sometimes we have a scalar, the data, some data can be a scalar, some data can be a vector, some data can be a matrix. So we could have different types of data. And what is the data type? 
if we want to have everything inside of it? What is the data type if we want to um, encapsulate everything inside of it? Then that's the data list, right? Data list is, it is the most flexible data variable uh, type in R. We could throw everything inside the data list. <clears throat> so then that's the reason why we do a data list here. Good, so we have the data list. Now the data part is ready already. And then the next step is we now have the data ready. We have to tell from R to stand what the data looks like, how the likelihood function look like. And uh, in fact, here I do not have to do it now because here has nothing to do with the stand file, right? So what I'm trying to do now is to write a stand model. So then the step is as simple as first, uh, create an empty file, and then you might want to save it as a stand model. So you create an empty file and you save it as my underscore first underscore stand underscore model. The important part is um, you have to have an extension of dot stand. So then that's the, the file extension. How this is how R, the package R, the language will recognize as a stand model, stand file. Good. So now you might have one observation. So the observation is, you see here, the icon of the file is changed from, from R to stand. So the idea is R, R Studio is able to recognize the stand file extension. So then it is a particular type of file extension, a stand model in this case. Okay, good. So we now have a stand model. And recall that stand is a block-based language. What blocks do we need? And I told you that we need at least three blocks. <clears throat> we have a data block, right? So the, the data block is to define what we know. And then the second block is the parameters block to define what we do not know, but we're interested in. And then the third block is a model block. So the model block is to make the connection between the data and the parameter. In other words, this is the place to define the likelihood. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is the structure, it is empty. And whenever you write a stand model, I would really encourage you to write this way. So you write first the structure, the empty blocks, and then to, to build complexity on top of the, the empty structure. Okay, so now we will focus on uh, each of the block one by one. So the data block, as I told you, is a place to tell Stan what the data variables are. And we have only two data variables. We have this small w and the capital N, right? So those are the data variables, the small w and the capital N. And you might, you might wonder sometimes, so why here I do not say capital W? So why here I do not say small n? So uh, it's possible to do that way. But I, what, whatever you do, you have to keep it consistent with the data you defined in R. So here, this line I highlighted is the data list. These variables, the, the name of the variables has to be the same as here. So I have to change the order of what I'm saying. So here, these variables, they have to be the same as what you define here in the data list because you define the data list first and then you give it to them, okay? So this is the order. So they, they have to be consistent. If they cannot, if they are not consistent, then uh, you could imagine Stan will not find the match in the data file, in the data variable, and then it cannot go forward. Good. So we know the variable names, small w and capital N. 
and uh, here there's there's some error or complaint here there's something wrong uh, each line in stem you have to terminate that with a semicolon so this is something you might have to remember so every time you write a line you have to terminate it by a semicolon so here the block name here you do not have to do that but everything inside you have to have a semicolon good and there is still an error so what that means right so um, in, in, in theory, uh, in stance, then in, in the first place, if you have never seen it before, this is a language, uh, it is also a special feature. So whenever you want to define, whenever you want to use a variable, you have to define the type of the variable. Type means, is that a scalar, is that a vector, is that a matrix, or it can also be specific. So is it, if that is a scalar, is it a, uh discrete variable or is it a continuous variable okay so we have to declare the type of the data so we know that the small w both of the small w and the capital n they are discrete variables and to declare a discrete variable instance we use the, the keyword uh, the preserved word uh, int for integer so uh it is integer and the name is a small w. And we do the same for the capital N, okay? So it, this is variable declaration. It reads as we declare an integer variable, the name is small w, and we declare another integer variable, a discrete variable, that the name is capital N. So this, the, the, this is the data declaration. So, if you have seen this if you haven't seen this before and this if it is the first very first time you are seeing this you might really think this is a little bit uh weird because all the other languages you you know you are learning you do not have to do the data type declaration you can just use it right and in, in this case the reason here is it is because um that is that there are there are multiple uh, checks and uh um because we will use statistical distributions. So some statistical distributions only works with discrete data. Some other distributions only works with continuous data. So you have to tell explicitly so which the data type is, otherwise there will be a mistake. So in this case, because the data is a discrete variable, we might, want, we might only consider something like a binomial distribution or Poisson distribution because that distributions, they deal with discrete data. In other words, those discrete data cannot be following, following a normal distribution, which deals with continuous variable. So this, in other words, is trying to um, make yourself think twice before you really go forward. And this is also a way to prevent mistakes. Because if you know the type of the data, you really will you you really won't make too much mistakes. Okay, so um, you will you will you will see more examples, and you will get used to it whenever you use it. And at the beginning, you might think it is weird, but gradually, I guess you will love it. Good. So here it is the data part, integer of small w and integer of capital N. So that's it. So what I usually also do is to uh, give a lower bound if we know the range of the data. So here what that means, that means we declare an integer, a discrete variable, at least zero or a above zero and then the name is capital uh, the name is small w so why i say a lower zero here because sometimes um by typo if you have a typo in your r script you might just type small w equals minus six for whatever reason you just say minus six this will be accepted if you do not have the lower bound but it will not be accepted if you write this way. So, so far the way I showed you here. So it is a sanity check to prevent you, to further prevent you from making mistakes. 
right? If you know the data, it must be positive. If you have a number of participants or number of trials, you can also do this way. You can also say lower is zero because the number of participants cannot be negative. The number of trials can also not be negative. So it, it is a good sanity check from my point of view. <clears throat> okay, that's it, the data part. And then we have the known part, that's the data. We have the small w, we have the capital, and now we move forward. We, we move forward uh, to discuss how do we declare a continuous variable in the parameters block. First of all, we have to name it as theta with a semicolon. Now we are used to it already. So uh, int is the keyword to define a discrete variable. And what is the keyword for declaring a continuous variable in STEM, it is a real number, okay? Real number is continuous, good. And uh, by definition, the theta parameter in the binomial function, it is a parameter that's above zero and smaller than one. In other words, we have to give the boundaries in this way. So, it reads as we declare a continuous variable, minimum zero, maximum one, and the name is theta, okay? So that's the parameter part, it is done. It's as simple as this line, this one line. And the final step is to write down the likelihood function. So how we connect known part with the unknown part. Okay, so this requires you to have some, some domain knowledge of what distribution you would like to use. In this case, I told you it will be a binomial model, but what if you do not know? So I, I will cover both of the situations. In this case, for now, we, we know it is a binomial model. And what we want to do is um, to specify how we would like to specify this, um, to write down the binomial model in the model block. <clears throat> okay, good. So recall from the slides, we have a small w is distributed as a binomial function with a capital N and a parameter theta. Sorry. Yes. So we wrote this way in on the slides. And uh, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, instead we can write this way the same as how we declare that in the st statistical textbook, textbook. So here this line, if you recall how we declare that in the, on the slides, we basically copy paste from there to here. And we write this way. And then that's it. That's simply how we have a simple and a complete STEM model. So now I will just go back and work you through one more time. We have a STEM model. We create empty file and we save it as my first STEM model dot stem. It, it has a special file extension stem file. We have three blocks, the data block to define what we know, the parameters block to define what we do not know, and the model block to define how we link the data to the unknown parameters, okay? And inside of each block, whenever we want to use a variable, we would like to, or we have to, declare the type of the data. So in this case, both the small w and the capital N, they are discrete variables. We use the keyword integer, int, to declare that. We could also give the lower boundary to have a sanity check. So this is what we did. And move on to the parameters block. It is a continuous variable. Then we use the word uh, real, real number, to declare the parameter theta. And then the theta, by definition, also have some um, um, boundaries, limits. There's a low, lower limit. There is also an upper limit. So lower equals zero, upper equals one. We give that. The, Model block here, we connect, we combine, we, we make the connection between the, the known data and the unknown parameter. Because we know it is a, is a bino, binomial distribution, we say uh, the small w is distributed as a binomial 
function with the capital N and the I theta distribution. Okay, good. There, there is a technical um, detail, which is so how we know so why why we know it is a binomial function. I mean, how we know that the name is binomial, not B norm or something something different. We know in R the binomial distribution is named B norm, not binomial, the full spell. Uh, so the, the solution or the answer is that we have the stand language, we have a reference, an index. So whenever you install the R stand or the stand language in, um, in your computer, and you might just wonder how do you want to use it, and what are the names of different distribution functions. So then the place to go to is the menu, the stand menu at the very end. And there's index part, and then there, there, that, that, there, that is a place which tells you uh, how to, uh, how this, how each distributions are named in STEM. So in this case, if we look it up, we know it is a binomial full spell or small cases. So binomial unit B is not capital B; it is small b. Okay, good. So this also answers you the the question. If you do not know what is the uh, the function name in STEM, so you go to the STEM menu. We could imagine another example, just say a regression model, and we know that the likelihood is a normal distribution. We will cover that also later. So if we know that the likelihood is a normal distribution, and we want to know how the normal distribution is is termed, is defined in the STEM language, so we again go to the STEM menu, and we will see how the, uh, the normal distribution is specified in that language in STEM. Good. <clears throat> so far, so good. And we might have another line, which is optional, but I can tell you why. Uh, we know that because this is, we are doing Bayesian inference and we need priors, right? We need priors. So the theta parameter follows the uniform distribution. with a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of one. So this is the flat prior that we talked about quite a few times. So this line is optional. Um, we can comment it out. So to comment out anything you write or to make comments, you use double slash. So double slash means to comment it out, okay? So why this line is optional? So we do not have to have it. It is because we have already defined or declared the variable theta with a lower bound of zero and upper bound of one. This, by definition, we already have a flat prior instead. So here there, it, it, there is an implicit uniform prior. So if you declare this way already, this line is there implicitly. So you do not really have to write down, okay? And then to make it really complete, so we could make further comments. We can say um, norm data. It's obvious, but I just give you this uh, the the descri descriptions of each block. Unknown parameters. Likelihood to connect, to make the association between the data and the variable. <clears throat> the data and the parameter, good. So now this is a complete stand file, stand model. And what you do next is to click here. So in R, if this file is a dot .stand file, R Studio will recognize that as a stand file. And then there is a functionality, there is a check button. So this check button is to check the, uh, the correctness of the syntax of the STEM model you write. So if whenever you write down your STEM model and the first step after you write it, after you write it up, the first step is always to check 
if it is correct. So here uh, it says this model is syntactically correct. So that means we can go forward. So it checks the grammatical or syntactical uh, correctness of the STEM model. There are some uh, criteria of the checking, checking function. So if there is a mistake, the checking function will tell you where it might go wrong. <clears throat> so I can show you one example as simple as what if I remove the semicolon? We know that it, it will be a mistake. And if we check it, you will see here parse expected. There is a semicolon expected. And then you need to go back to check which line is missing a semicolon. And then you have to complete it. Then you run again. Uh, this time it is, it is correct. Good. <clears throat> So now we finished our second step. The first step to prepare data in R, the second step is to write a STEM model. And then the last step is to estimate the model, to fit the model to the data. But before that, so the, the STEM part here, the specification in STEM, is there, are there any questions from you? Does everything make sense? Good. Okay. Yeah, there is a comment uh, regarding using double slash to comment. So what, what you are familiar with is perhaps to use a hash tag to comment, right? Comment. And uh, it, is, it was possible. Well, it is still possible. Uh, but then the, the stand team, they changed it. So if you write this way, you will see a warning. So here, comments with the hash is not continued, so um, deprecated. Please use double hash in place of the hash double slash in place of the hash for, for line comments. It is still possible, but you will see uh, the warning. It doesn't matter, but maybe to use slash, double slash in the future. Good, so now we move forward to fit the model to the data. So we have the data, we have the model, now we do it to combine, right? So the first step is to load the library. And uh, maybe I didn't send you the email last time, but I will do it today. Uh, here, you have to install the package in the first place. And after the installation, if you want to use it, you have to call it. You have to load it into your R workspace to do a library R stand. And uh, these two are for configurations. I will go back to tell you what they mean, not now. We have to write and then I can explain what they mean. So here it is important. So what is the file name? So where R or R Studio could find your R stand model, okay? So you assign your uh, file name in a string, in a character, and then you assign it to a variable called model file. So this is simply the path the folder, the subfolder, and also the name of your stand file. So my underscore first and score stand and score model. So that's exactly the way I wrote it. I named it. So here I will explain what is this. The number of iterations is in the case of a MCMC robots, we ask the robots so how many times it will visit each location. Because we would like to draw samples to approximate the unknown shape, we have to let the robot to visit a reasonable amount of, of, of different locations so that it could give us a stable estimation. So if we only ask the robot to visit 10 times, so this 10 times of inf location information is not really informative for us to know the shape because 
it's too sparse. We do not really have enough sample to approximate um, the unknown shape. So we would like to have some uh, big enough numbers of visits for the robots to visit, right? In this case, we let the MCMC sampler to have uh, 2,000 of visits or 2,000 of iterations. So this is the number of iterations. The next one is number of chains. So from the illustration we have seen the last time, uh, each of the MCMC robots, it's, it formulates a chain, right? So you have a random starting point and then it visits from the random starting point to somewhere uh, is to somewhere where the density is high, to somewhere where the mountain is high. Th those are called MCMC chains. And uh, if we would like to have a stable estimation, we do not ask only one robot. We ask multiple, because if in the case where multiple random starting uh, MCMC robots, they converge at the same place, then that means it, it is stable. If one robot goes here and then the other robot goes there, then that means, well, maybe this result is not reliable. So we have to have a converge, convergence uh, evidence of the unknown shape of the parameter space. So in this case, we set up four random starting MCMC chains. So here, number of chains, four. Good. <clears throat> so the number of warm up. It is for the HMC algorithm. So the HMC in the first place will fine tune to find some uh, internal parameters. So don't get confused. Those internal parameters has nothing to do with the parameters in your model. So it is internal parameter for uh, stand for HMC to efficiently sample the unknown space, the posterior. So the, the internal parameters can be uh, you imagine again in the MCMC robot example, so how large each step is, for example. So something like that. So those internal uh, parameters, how the algorithm works. So in this way, you could just basically have a simple understanding. <clears throat> and uh, so I still haven't yet explained what an warm up means. So to fine tune, these internal parameters, this procedure is called warm up. And the warming up part requires MCMC samples. So the robots may be the first few uh, visits, the locations. It, it is for exploration. It, it is for the algorithm to find which is the optimal step and uh, which is optimal this, optimal that. So this optimization requires half of the iterations. So here, I say, I want the robot to use half of the iterations to fine tune the internal parameters. Okay, good. And thing is, uh, in that is kind of a useless parameter. So the idea is, uh, which, how would you like to take the samples? So if simple is, if thinning is one, you will take every sample you have. So every sample, every location the robot visits, so if thinning is two, then that means you will take every second. You will take the first, the third, the fifth, and seventh, ninth. You will take every second with this uh, from the MCMC robots. But here by default, it's always one, so you shouldn't really worry too much about that. <clears throat> so now again, a quick summary. We tell our studio where uh, it can find the stand script, stand file. How many iterations? 2,000. How many MCMC chains? Four. How many iterations will be used for internal warming up? Half of the iterations, 1,000. And what is the thinning? Uh, one. Okay, good. And then you run it. No magic happened here yet. And then the core part, finally, um, this part is how you would like to fit the model to the data. And then the core function is called stan, okay? The core function is called stan. And then there are, uh, you need to give quite a few input arguments. 
The first one is you give the model file, not surprisingly. And then the second line, you give the data as a data list, right? And then the chains is number of chains, and the iteration is number of iterations. Warm up is number of warm up, number of thinning is number of thinning. So those are the variables we define um, in the above place. <clears throat> and two more input arguments to specify how we would like to stand to run. So here, initial numbers, we just say all those MCMC chains, they start randomly. So they have a random starting point. Good, so uh, we just say it is random. And uh, the last one is the seed for the random number generations. Uh, the idea is to, we would like to be able to reproduce ourselves, we would like to, have the results to be reproducible. So we know that uh, the random number, they, they generates randomly or pseudo randomly, if you know what I mean. If we set the seed and then the random number generation will always be uh, reproducible, it will be the same. So to set up the seed is for us to be able to reproduce ourselves. If we use the same seed, we will observe always the exact same results, okay? Good. So this is the core part, very good. And then before that, these three lines, and then after that, these three lines, um, it is to, um, to give you some helping message. So if you see here, what is the system time now? So when do I start? And then at the end time, what is the system time now when I finish? And then I use the finish time minus the starting time, which will be basically how long it takes to finish the model estimation. Okay, this is only for helping message and to recall how we used the cat function inside our script. We talked about briefly at the very beginning. Great. Any questions? Yeah, there is one. How do I get a seed? Right, this one, so how, do, how did I get this number? This is what I mean, right, I guess. Uh, it can be random, it can be one, two, three, it can be 1,000, 2,000, 1,001. So here, I can tell you later how I get this seed. So I, I run it from a random seed, and, and, and then I extract the seed of the previous run, and then I reuse it. So this is how I get it. But I can tell you later how I get, how I de derive a seed from a random, random, random draw. Good. So now we have everything. Now we could finally run the STEM model. So we have defined everything. We uh, prepare the data. We wrote the STEM file, and we specified how the model would run. So how many samples do we need? How many chains do we need? Okay. So those those are the uh, specifications that we would like to have. And then finally, we just run the model. So to run it, you just run it. You select all those lines and then you execute. So as you could see here, it's, uh, it's running, it's hang hanging there. There's uh, this stop button means you can stop it whenever you want. In other words, now it is running. So there's a helping message. It says, now I am calling four simulations or four MCMC chains instead. And then now it's, it's, it's trying to execute. So as I told you uh, a few minutes ago, the step of running STAN is we or STAN first convert or con uh, transform the STAN file into C++ and then does the compiling, the compilation. So here now what it takes time is the compiling part, okay? And then STEM will run from the C++. And then that's one of the reasons why it is efficient in terms of uh, the, uh, the speed and uh, the computational efficiency. I don't worry too much about that. So now we are just, we are just wait. We are just waiting for the results. Well, we are waiting. waiting. Any questions?
So while, while we are waiting, let me just try to summarize what we have done to give you a bigger picture. But I know you that, but I, I know that you you know that already. So the bigger picture is that we want to do Bayesian inference, right? We would like to do some Bayesian inference, and we would like to use a method called MCMC to do Bayesian inference. And uh, to do Bayesian inference, we use a program language called STAN. And to use STAN, we have to prepare the data in R and then to estimate the model in STAN. To prepare the data in R is simple and straightforward. We know that already. And then to write a STAN file, a write a STAN model is kind of new to us. And what I did is I created the empty STAN file and I worked you through how to write a simple STAN model step by step. And finally, when we have the data, when we have the model, we fit the model to the data using the STAN function in the R STAN package. Okay, this is what we have done. So this is the idea of what we are trying to do now, in case you're confused. <clears throat> Good. So now as you see here, well, this is the time. Uh, yeah, one minute ago. And uh, this is the entire duration. So how long it took to run the STEM model. So it took around two minutes, depends on how fast your computer is. So uh, you, might see, you might have seen here, this is the observation, right? So there is a viewer tab in our studio. And uh, if you refresh it, because this runs rather fast, and you only, ha you only see it when you refresh it. <clears throat> so here, it says starting some worker, uh, blah, blah, blah. So th this is the, the CPU that is using. This is too much technical, but I can, um, uh I'll explain later so what is informative is here so stan is telling you sampling from this model so this is the model we wrote right and we have multiple chains so here chain number one is the iteration from one to uh to, from a zero percent to ten percent and then to finish everything so what do you see here the first 50 percent the first half it is for warming up this is how we specify, right? No surprising. And then the second half, if you see here, the final uh, in the parentheses, it says sampling. So it's not, it's, it is not warming up anymore, it is sampling. So the first half is for internal warming up optimization, and then the second half is for the, the actual sampling. Good. So the first chain, and then there's also the second chain, the third and the fourth and then it's finished, and then it's done. Good, <clears throat> very nice. As you could imagine, um, there are four chains. There are four chains. Because there are four chains, uh, we could execute the four chains in different ways. So one way is to, put, to run everything in theory. So one, two, three, four, run each, run each one only after the previous one is finished. We run the first, and after the, the first one is finished, we run the second, and after the second is finished, we run the third, and then so on and so forth. And we could also run everything in parallel, right? We could ev run also everything in parallel. We could say one, two, three, four, hey, those four chains, you can just run all together. You do not have to wait until the previous one is finished, and then you can just run everything in parallel. So those are the, the two ways, one in theory and uh, in theory or serial, Another is in parallel, okay, good. And how do I tell Stan uh, which way do I want it to, to run? It's, uh, it, it goes this way, it depends how many CPUs do I have. So if I would like the four chains to run in parallel, so each of the chain, they have to rely on each CPU on your computer, uh, the computing core, right, the CPU. So if you have, if you by chance have four cores or more than four, you can run each chain, each, each chain on each core. If you only have one core, one CPU in your computer, which is unlikely nowadays, but let's assume there is an old computer from 20 years ago, only one CPU, then all of the four chains you do have to run in serial. Good. So now I, I saw the question earlier. So uh, you, some of you were asking me what this means. So this means how many computer CPUs I would like Stan to use. Because I have four chains, I have four CPUs, more than enough, just exact, 
and I will say all of the four CPUs will be used in Stan, and then you, if you run Stan program, will run in parallel. Good. And another question I saw is, what if I have only two CPUs? That's also fine. So two run, two are running in parallel, and when the first two are finished, the second two starts, right? So this is the um, the idea. You might want to do some calculation and to, to determine how you would like to use your cores. And uh, if you have eight cores, do you use eight or do you use four? So, so far in this case, you will still use four because one chain will rely on one CPU. If you only have four chains, it's maximum, in it's will in maximum only use four CPUs. If you have eight, then the, 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 the other four, the remaining four will just be there, will be uh, in, in the vacant uh, situation. So it will not be used, in other words. So um, the maximum number of the cores you can use is the same as the number of chains. So here, these two, they can be um, the same if you, have, if you do have that many of cores. Good. And there is another related question. It is, well, how do I know how many cores I have on my computer? So if you're not really into this, you have no idea, you never have idea how many cores you have. You might have 16, honestly, if you have a really decent laptop or something or two if you have a rather old laptop. So if you're into that, you know there is a system uh, uh, property in a Windows or MacBook, you, you, you could get, uh, you, you're able to get the number. Um, so what I'm telling you now is you can get the number also in R. So what you do is that, There is a package in R, which is called parallel. So the parallel package, uh, if I write this way, I, I think I, re I told you earlier, if I write this double colon, that means uh, I am trying to call a function called detect calls from the package called parallel. So I'm basically trying to call a function that tries to tell me how many calls I have. So in this case, I have four in total. And if you run this line on your laptop now or later, you might have, I guess, minimum four nowadays, four, eight, uh, 16 also. Good. And then there's a technical detail is quite interesting is, so my computer, I know it, it has only two physical CPUs, but there are two virtual CPUs. So instead it's, um, uh, it utilizes both the physical, the actual core and the, the virtual core, okay? So anyway, this number is the number of CPU that Stan could make use of. Good. I don't want to turn it too technical, but since you're interested, I can explain more. <clears throat> Other questions? Let me see, sorry. Ah, yeah, so there's the question. So will the calculation take longer if I have more data? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It, it depends on how, how you define your data, how, how large the data is. If I say here, instead of nine and six, I say 90 and 60, this is not a larger data. So those are still two integers and the stand is efficient enough. So what can be different is that if you have data from uh, 20 participants relative to if you have data from 200 participants, this will make a difference if you cannot vectorize it. So vectorizing is another new concept but I, that, that I do not want to talk about today, but I can talk about later. So here in this case, I only put nine and six. So in the model, only one line, right? So only one line, nine or six, or 90 or 60 does not make a difference in terms of the calculation. In this case, I don't think the calculation time will change a lot.
there's another question. Uh, so, where is it, sorry. Is it possible to let the GPU to run the graphical um, processing unit? I'm not sure, I think the, the CMD, the command stand, it is possible, but not here. And I also don't think that is necessary. So it doesn't really matter too much. Another question, so does the time, the calculation time, depends on the number of chains and iterations? Did this, yes, this, yes. So if you have 2,000 iterations, relative to if you have 20,000 iterations, of course, the 20,000 iteration will take longer than the 2,000 iteration version. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? Did I answer everything? So there is one more part I haven't explained. There's only one line here, this line. This line I haven't explained. So what that means? Um, so we have seen that if you run a stand model for the very first time, it might take a while, two minutes, one or two, one, one and a half, because the compiling, it takes some time, right? In our previous case, I showed you, it took in, in total two minutes. So if I run it again, I'm selecting all those lines again. So I'm running it. So now this, this, this time, <clears throat> it's only seven seconds. So why, why there is a difference? So why in the first instance, it take two minutes, 120 seconds, and in the second time when we run it, it only take seven seconds. So it is because the compiling part is skipped if we are doing that for the second time. So if we are running the same model again and again, so the compilation, we could reuse the very first one. So in theory, that means we do not have to compile every single time. So the, the later stand model uh, estimation could rely on your previous compiled C++ object, if I'm not being too technical. <clears throat> so this is the idea. And how did I tell Stan to reuse the previous compiling part, compiled results? This is this part. To auto write the, the C++ object and then to reuse it. So this is, this, this is what this line does. <clears throat> And then if you could imagine, well, let's try, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So if you say, and I have 90 times of experiment and I observe 60 times of water observation. So this is data, right? Now we, now we update our data. We have 90 and 60 instead of nine and 10. The other parts I do not have to change. So I run the same thing. The only difference is, I told you, the data is increased by 10 times. You could guess how long it will take. So it's, it's the same. So it's, uh, it's still, again, seven, seven, seven seconds. Not the same, but somehow similar. But just the same, conceptually. Good? Does that make sense? Because there are two integers. So 70, uh, no 70, sorry, 60, 90, and 6, 9, there's no difference to stand in the way how we specify the model. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, I move a little bit forward. So we have the data, we have the model, we, have, we run it, and then that's the running part. So how we draw inference, how we draw conclusions, what are the results, right? So what are the results of, uh, uh, of the STEM model? So here, this is the results part, feed underscore globe. So we use this one to draw inference. So what we do is now we use the print function and then 
we will see something like this. So let me spend two minutes on the slides because here it is the same. So here I did uh, a printing function and then the input argument is the fit object. Okay, good. So first of all, it, told, it tells us again to remind us what we have done. So we are trying to draw inference for the step model, this, or in other case, my first step model, doesn't matter because I changed the name. We run four chains, each with iteration of 2000. Warm up is the first half, the thinning is one. So now you can do some calculations. So how many post warm up samples do we have? So post warm up means what, how many samples we have after the internal optimization. So we used 2000 in total, first thousand for internal optimization, and then the second 1000 is for sampling, right? And we have not one kind of this 1000, we, we have four this kind of 1000. So in total, we have four multiply with 1000, we have 4000 valid post warm up samples. So here it is that the line says, well, we have total post warm up draws 4000. Good. And we, 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 we can do this calculation, right? To make sure that what we know is correct based on the, the, the specification. <clears throat> And then to draw inference, we look at this table. So there, this is the theta parameter, and uh, it will be a distribution before we see the shape. And here is some uh, numeric summary of the distribution. We have a mean, it is 0.64, and we have standard deviation, standard error of that uh, estimation. And uh, uh, we have the quantiles of the parameter as well, so 2.5, 25, blah, blah. And this one is important. So what is the, the number of effective samples? We have 4,000 samples. So here, um, not all of the samples, they could give some independent contribution to the parameter estimate. So some of them, they are related. So if, if, one, if two samples are related, then effectively, this two sample might mean 1.5, for example. This is not a bad thing because uh, the visits of the robots, so the new position depends on the previous one. There's always some dependency in the MCMC. So this is how the algorithm works. This is not bad. But you might wonder what, what is a good number of effective number of parameters, effective number of samples. Out of 4,000, we have 1,200. Is that good enough or too small? Or So what is the criteria? Do, do I know it? Um, the, the answer is it depends, but you do not really look at the effective uh, number of samples, the number of effective uh, samples. You look at here, there, the, the last column, which is called the R hat. So this one. So we have a statistics to tell us if the effective samples, the number of effective samples are, are big enough. So if this R hat statistics is close to one, so the theoretical number of R hat is one, minimum is one, it can be one, it can be higher than one. One is good, one is a good criteria. So if we see the R hat is one, then that means we have a reasonable, uh, this uh, reasonably good amount of effective samples out of 4,000. If we have an R hat that is above one, that means um, you, you, that something might go wrong, something might go wrong. And uh, I think we can talk about that later. So what is a, a bad R hat number? Is it 1.5 or two or 10? So I can tell you later what that means. Yeah, I think I will stop here. And I guess that's enough for today. To summarize what we have done today. We are trying to do a Bayesian inference, again, for the globe tosing example. We have the data, we have the model. We have the six and nine data, we have the model of a binomial. We prepare the data in R, we write a stand model, and we feed the model to the data, we run everything. And uh, we have seen the results of using a print 
function to see the summary, to see what are the numbers. And then next week, we will see some illustration, uh, some plots, and how that is connected to the other solutions, for example, from the grid approximation. And then we make everything together, and then we move forward onto some other examples. Good. Any questions regarding the, uh, the stand here? I will tell you later about the review comments and uh, uh, the data camp. But anything, any question related to here, the stand part? Good. Yeah, I guess that it's today what I talk about is a little bit technical, but since everything is recorded, I really encourage you to, to look at it again and try out um, to open, to create an empty file and then follow what I did today to complete, to finish your first STEM model and fit the model to the data using the example we have. Okay. So about the model, does the order matter? What do you mean? Do you mean the, the blocks? So the data block, yes, so the, the order. Yes, 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 yes. Good question. The order has to be the same. You can skip. So here, this one, we didn't have to transform the data block. We didn't have this one, we didn't have this one. You could skip uh, a few of them, but the order has to be the same. Yes, good question. Yes. We talk about the, late, the order also later next week. Other questions? No, I guess.